So we're here at the HPE booth, and uh, who are you? I'm Dennis Floyd, I'm part of the Apollo 70 team, and I'm holding the Apollo 70 compute node. It's the first uh, ARM, ARM compute node actually designed specifically for the HPC market. Uh, this is a one-use uh, node, there, it, there's also a two-use node, which uh, allows for two, two, two processors and two GPUs. So, uh, where did the GPUs go? Where did the GPUs go? Yeah. The GPUs, there's one slot here and one here. So and, there, and there are actually risers that 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 you that they mounted to. So that could be like a regular uh, NVIDIA 1080 or something like that. Uh, I or think a the original one is with uh, an AMD Fire Pro. So AMD uh, GPU that's specially made for for, uh, for uh, supercomputing. Um, Damn it, I'll go. No. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, but but right here is the Thunder X2. It's Thunder X2 two from Cavium. Um, it's uh, the next generation of the ARM SOC. And uh, what are you talking about here in the, in the wall? You're talking about the whole uh, collaboration? So, we, we actually, uh, as, as part of our development model, we worked with the Department of Energy Labs uh, on a program we call Comanche, which uh, is essentially a, an early adopter program. We uh, provided them with these uh, with the Apollo 70 early on, and they've been working to develop uh, a software with it and to uh, uh, to utilize it in their in their uh, their space. And uh, so there's a software stack up in HPC. There's a ARM Alunea Studio, AMD GPU software. Everything just works together. And some stuff going on with Mellanox and Red Hat, Suze. Uh, we've got OS, it's set up for OS, but Suze and Red Hat. Uh, and what are you showing over there? That corner there. So this is the, the rack? This is, the, this is actually the 2U version of it. Pop it open, you'll see inside. And the chip? That's the cadmium. Yeah, it's a... Uh, Can we look under it? And on the, on the back of it, oh. does it have all the connectors? Cool. And this one you can open? Yeah, I can open this one. So that's two. It's, uh, um, it sits in the uh, Apollo 2000 rack, so it's a, it's a known rack that we can use it. Okay, so standard size. Yeah. And uh, let's jump over there. Uh, can you introduce these guys, what they're doing over there? Hi. Uh, she worked on the machine, and I'll let her come here. Hello, so who are you? My name is Lisa Pilati, and I'm a senior system engineer working for Hewlett Packard Labs. And uh, what are you showing here? This is an ARM solution? It is an ARM solution. It is the first instantiation of the machine of memory driven computing architecture. And this I is the machine. This is it's, a prototype of the it's machine. It's called the machine. The machine. Why? Because the idea is that the technology that we're developing as part of the machine program can really be used in a variety of different ways. It can be used in serv servers you know, for an exascale type solution. It can also be used in smaller systems. So we called it something that a little bit non-specific to re-emphasize that it's really the technology and the architecture that is the focus of the program. So there's a whole bunch of special things going on here, right? There's, a, there's an ARM server here, ARM yes. chip. Yes, this is a high-performance ARM processor. It's a Cavium Thunder X2. Thunder X2 right here. Correct. And then there's a, what's going on around here? So the, out of the ARM processor, there are ICI links that come out. This is an FPGA that provides translation from the links coming from the processor out to the other parts of the system. So this is a memory semantic fabric. It's the precursor to Gen Z. So once you're at Gen Z, you can talk to fabric attached memory anywhere in the system. For instance, over here. So Gen Z is right here, it says Gen Z. Yes. So that's a it's new idea? Yes, it's a new fabric. So think of InfiniBand or Ethernet. It's a new memory semantic fabric. There's a consortium of, I believe, over 40 different people, um, different vendors, server, uh, operating system, networking, components of a wide variety of partners. So was that originally your idea or somebody at HPE, right? And then they decided to open it up? 
Well, I, it was really a group effort. Uh, we certainly are one of the 12 founding partners, but it really is a collaborative effort across all the different events. So is the idea to have one ARM chip with a ton of RAM, or is that what it is? So is what you really want is you want to have with memory-driven computing, you want to have a very large pool of non-volatile memory. And then you want to have processors that talk directly to that memory. In today's processor-centric architects, architectures, you have memory that's attached to processors. And if you need more pro memory, you have to scale them in lockstep. And then this processor has to talk to that processor to get to this memory. What if you had a really large pool of non-volatile memory and the processors could talk directly to that memory? And because this memory is non-volatile, you don't have to be moving your data from main memory to storage and back and forth. And what if because you're talking to that large pool of memory with the Gen Z fabric, any type of processor can talk to that main memory. So if your application wants an x86 processor, great. If it wants a GPU to run on it more efficiently, great. So you get to pick the processor and the application uh, for that works best for your application. So uh, one of those cables going all over there. So this is just an electrical interconnect from that has the Gen Z fabric going off to this large pool of fabric attached memory. Here we have four FPGAs, and they are fabric or memory media controllers. So they're converting the Gen Z fabric to whatever memory or storage media you happen to have. In this case, it's DDR4 memory because that's what we could get for a fairly low cost. Um, so we have 160 terabytes in four enclosures, and so we could get that in DDR4 for how much terabytes? 160 terabytes of RAM of RAM in four enclosures, but that's 20 U. Four many, terabytes how many just here. ARM processors run that. So uh, there is four terabytes and one processor per node, 40 nodes. So four terabytes of RAM just per on the ARM node. processor. Correct. But again, four terabytes is a lot. People usually talk in gigabytes, right? Yes. Four terabytes is a lot. It's a lot of RAM, right? Terabytes. But exactly. But that's the idea behind this memory-driven computing architecture because now if you have that large pool of memory and it's non-volatile so you don't have to worry about moving it out to storage because it costs too much to refresh that amount of memory continuously, you can just keep it there. And so it's readily accessible by all your CPUs when you need it. And you're not paying to refresh it if you don't happen to be using it. And the Thunder X2 is great at managing four terabytes of RAM? Uh, yes. So um, you know, the idea again behind the, the it totally architecture. It has no issues with that. It can just manage, it can just work with so much RAM. Well, we are uh, up to four terabytes, yes. Once you get to a certain level, you run out of physical addressing. So where we have a scheme where we have aperture windows, so only so much of the physical memory is uh, visible to the o to the processor, and then we switch apertures if you, what you need is outside of that window. And uh, what are you talking about here? Um, it says so, um, we've to, we have a Linux team that has made changes to support a memory-driven computing architecture, and we call it Linux for the machine. And so they've submitted over 4,000 submissions to open source because we're trying to build the ecosystem around this memory-driven computing architecture. That's why we're part of this the This is a logo right here, the that's, machine. That's correct. Sounds like a movie or something. Well, we were in a movie. We were mentioned in uh, The Ghost. Really? What is the one with Scarlett Johansson? Uh, oh, really, The Ghost. My, my, my colleague, uh, my, my school friend was uh, acting in that one. Oh, he yeah. Was, uh, the, he was the second role. But So, in, in The Ghost, they're talking about how much RAM you're using per ARM CPU, or they're not mentioning it? They, they, they just very, it, right? she, very fleetingly mentioned the machine. Ah, they're not like talk going. It would be so they cool. Do, they, they don't would, go on and on. They said, "Ah, oh, it's a great way to add some RAM to the ARM processor." Yeah. But they didn't mention no, that. No, they did not. But so the machine is eventually going to take over everything. Is that what it happened? Well, no, I'm joking. We, okay. no, well, because there's an explosion of data, right? I mean, there's still going to be need for your traditional processors, 
but they're estimating that the explosion of data is coming right at the time where our ability to keep up from a compute point of view is running out because Moore's Law has served us very, very well for many, many years, but it's starting to run out of steam just at the same point that the amount of data that we're having to deal with because we all have our you know, six or seven devices and more is occurring. So that's why we think a revolutionary new architecture is needed, like memory-driven computing, to deal with that amount of data. Is this video also talking about that? So this video, yes, is on the machine, and so uh, here we're running an application on it. Here you can see some of the video of the machine, and here this node is getting plugged into an enclosure, and we have people talking about it. So uh, how soon is this going to take over the whole supercomputing market? <laughs> I think it will take some time. It takes some time to build a completely new uh, ecosystem. Why? Can't well, you just get a, a few more extra help and stuff and get it done? Or? Well, that's why we have submitted all the changes we've made to Linux to open source, to GitHub. We have a machine users group so that people can learn more about the machine and think about how they can make modifications to their applications to take advantage of it. We're part of the Gen Z consortium. We're working with vendors to support their processors on Gen Z and in memory-driven computing. And a uh, more basic Apollo 70, uh, is that a stepping stone or? You could think of it as a stepping stone. So this has the same processor um, uh, as the Apollo 70, but again, here's our uh, product with the ARM processor. And uh, why is it shaped like this over here? What's over here? So these are switches. There's four switches. And this... Oh, you have a whole bunch of those, and this is a different place in the rack. Yeah. Well, what happens is that this is a single node. So it has one processor and up to four terabytes. Of, this is the processor, sorry. You flip it up vertically, and 10 of them plug into this set of switches. And these switches are Gen Z and Gen Z out. So they allow any processor to access fabric attached memory anywhere in the enclosure. Uh, is there, do you talk about, is this FPGAs too? These are FPGAs as well. Do you talk well. about what FPGA you're using or so, secret? Uh, we have not told which vendor of FPGAs that we're using. and. Um, but the vendor that you're using is probably very excited about this. They, I would hope that they are. Or they're trying to fight to be the one that provides the best solution for this. Well, they're obviously very high performance state of the art FPGAs. So we're helping them push the extremes of their technology. And uh, what would you be able to uh, demand? Because the Thunder X2 is great, right? It's fantastic. Right. But you have some demands for Thunder X3. What do you think would be great for the next ARM chipset? Would it be a uh, support more than four terabytes or? Oh yeah, I think that we would always love to have be able to support a larger set of um, physical address memory space. That would be great. Um, it'd be wonderful if processors had the Gen Z links incorporated into the processor itself, because then we wouldn't have to go through a bridge chip, and we'd have even less latency to talk to that fabric attached memory. So you just um, ask them, they will add it, right? They're, they're very good at adding a lot of stuff in their SOC. I am sure that um, Cavium is part of the uh, Gen Z consortium, and so I'm sure there are a lot of discussions happening. I'm not part of the, the okay. consortium, so I don't know. What's, where's the bridge chip? This is the bridge chip. It's the FPGA then? Yes. So you use an FPGA, it would be nice to have it. Uh, and there's some other FPGAs around. Right. So there's not only those, there's some more. Right. right. I mean, you can't only have so much, because what you want to do is, with your memory media controllers, you want to go from Gen Z, and you want to be able to support different types of memory or storage media, right? Cool. And uh, uh, so the, the, the biggest cost right here is the RAM, right? The, the ARM chip is kind of like relatively low compared to everything else. When you're using really large 128 gigabytes, by DIMMs, yes. Uh, That's so, the highest cost. So hopefully the cost of RAM is going to go down or something. Well, that could help this. There, the cost of memory does go down over time, right? So it's, we've used the largest capacity DIMMs available at this time.